and welcome to Power Dilemmas here with Sarah Bukhari at TAG TV. Last week, uh, the world saw two major terrorist attacks, one at the West End and the other in the East End, the Islamic world. Brussels became a target of terror attack in Europe, whereas Lahore became a target of terror attacks in the Islamic world in Pakistan. To understand the ideology of terrorism, ISIS, ISIL, Al-Qaeda, we have a wonderful guest today with us, Dr. Michael uh, Richard Bonner, who is a linguist, and he has uh, done his MPhil and DPhil from Oxford University. He has traveled far and wide, particularly Iran, the Middle East, and can speak a lot of languages, Persian, Arabic, as well as Armenian. And he will be giving us an insight on the ideology of ISIS, ideology of Islamist terrorism, and a lot more. In addition, um, he has written uh, this uh, wonderful book, and uh, Dr. Bonner, if you want to tell the name of the book to our viewers, so that they can get a copy and get an understanding of the cultures uh, in the Middle East. So this book is called uh, Al Dinwari's Kitab Al Akhbar Al Tuel, an historiographical study of Sasanian Iran. It's basically a study of the history of pre-Islamic Persia, going really uh, right up to the earliest days of. Islam. The author in question, he was actually writing in the ninth century. He was a Persian, probably of Kurdish extraction, who had some very strong opinions on, uh, on uh, his, uh, his country's past, uh, on uh, its uh, ancient religion, its ancient monarchy, and also on its current religion. He himself was a first generation convert to Islam. And he presents what we would call today a nationalist view of Iranian history. Okay, so uh, moving forward in our interview and uh, getting back to the terrorist attacks in uh, Brussels, uh, what do you think, how was the security apparatus uh, working in Brussels? Would you consider it a failure? Well, from, uh, from what I've read, I think we have, uh, you know, we have serious reasons to, to doubt its uh, efficacy and we may go as far as to say that it was a failure. My understanding is that Abdeslam was indeed captured, but the, uh, the authorities failed to interrogate him properly. Why? Well, it, I can't really explain why. It seems, it, it seems ludicrous to imagine that uh, the, the, the Brussels authorities refused to question him thoroughly simply on the grounds that he was tired. Now, I, I would have thought that based on his connection with uh, ISIS alone, that that would be sufficient grounds to, to, to subject him to rigorous interrogation and to, to look into the possibility of a future terrorist attack, but that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, being a historian, um, I really like to trying to see what is the historical reasons behind uh, terrorism. Let's have a look into the historical uh, precepts of uh, terrorism. Well, we have to go back to the earliest days of, of, uh, of Islam. Now, in th th this, this takes us back to, let's say, the, the, close of the, the close of the 6th century and then right, into the, right up to the middle of the 7th century uh, AD. The world was dominated by two superpowers. One was the Roman Empire. The other was the uh, Persian Empire at the time ruled by the Sasanian uh, dynasty. Now, these two empires were so old at the time that no one could have imagined uh, a point at which they did not exist or a point in the future when they would not exist. Even in the Quran, uh, both empires are referred to. There's even the, the Surat al-Rum, which refers specifically to the Roman Empire. Uh, more importantly, it even refers to the last great war fought between the two great powers. Now, why is this significant? Well, for reasons which scholars are still looking into and which, still, uh, which are still fodder for great debate, the Arabs uh, themselves had, had been left out of the game of empire. But with the preaching of the new religion of Islam by Muhammad, uh, that changed. And they very quickly uh, overcame tribal differences. And within 
really a matter of years, conquered the, the Iranian Empire wholesale and much of the Roman Empire. It was violent, destructive, bloody, and uh, it was really without precedent uh, in, in, in history. It makes the rise of the, of the Roman Empire and the conquest of the Roman Republic seem extremely slow by comparison. This was, you know, Iran was swallowed in a period of less than 10 years. This gave the Arabs an empire, an empire which they were obliged to defend and which appeared to justify the warfare that they had been engaged in. Now, of course, the history of Islam isn't all uh, warfare and bloodshed, but there is a substantial portion there which is still, which still apparently motivates people. And I would look for the origin of, uh, of terrorism and fighting, and especially of the jihad, in the earliest and formative days of Islam. What are terrorists looking at right now? What are the, these terrorists originating from ISIS or Al-Qaeda and Taliban, Taliban? What are they looking at? What are their goals? Well, I, I, don't, want to, uh, I don't want to speak for terrorists and explain what their goals are, but... I think that it's very important to take to take threats seriously when we encounter them. The uh, the, uh, the reason for this is 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 somewhat uh, somewhat paradoxical. The the, the 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 idea of a caliphate of a of a political order based on succession to the the uh, Prophet Muhammad is for modern people, that should come across as a bit of a silly idea. I mean, if, if, if I decided to preach a political doctrine or uh, espouse a, a, a legal uh, ideology connected with reviving the Roman Empire, uh, people would find that odd. And yet here we are. We have a caliphate. We have a real live caliphate with its own caliph. And this is... This was uh, an ideology or a political order that was dormant for a very long time. The last serious caliph was killed in 1258. The Ottoman Empire pretended to have some uh, authority to, to rule in place of the caliph, but uh, it was as good as dead until ISIS came along. And now it seems to be a serious thing which poses... Uh, a th it poses a threat to the West, if uh, a and and has already destroyed much of the of much of the Middle East. Uh, we can't just laugh it off. As ridiculous as as, uh, as as ridiculous as it may seem, we can't laugh it off. It's serious. It's it's something that people believe in, and it's something which we need to stop and fight. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, draw a distinction uh, among the various sects of terrorism? That is. ISIL, ISIS, Al Qaeda, and Talibanized uh, Talibans, or they're the same bulk, they're the same family? Well, I, I would say that, you know, you know that, uh, you know that someone's doing something wrong when, uh, uh, you know, Al Qaeda condemns them. And when, uh, when Al Qaeda is calling out ISIS for going a little bit too far, I think that that's, uh, that's a sign that, you know, something is really profoundly wrong. But they are originally from the same, uh, they're, they're cut from the same cloth. They, s they, they, have the, 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 they have common roots in what we call Wahhabism. Wahhabism itself goes back a long way. Wahhabism is, of course, named after uh, Abdul Wahhab, who was a, uh, a sort of puritanical preacher in what is now Saudi Arabia in the 18th century. But what he was preaching has its roots in uh, another uh, uh, Muslim thinker, Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah was a 13th century uh, jurist or sort of uh, legal uh, uh, student of the Sharia. And um, he saw the destruction of the caliphate in 1258 by the Mongols as uh, a just punishment for uh, basically uh, decadence, the, the decadence of the, of, the, of the Abbasid Caliphate, in response to which he preached a doctrine of Puritanism, of uh, renewal of, 
of uh, sort of the fundamentals of Islam. Um, he hated idolatry. He wanted to whitewash uh, mosques and, and, and tombs that were visited, tombs of holy men or Muslim saints, just as, just as uh, uh, radical Protestants did much the same sort of thing in, in Europe during the Reformation. And he had some other very peculiar habits of chopping down trees that he thought were uh, worshipped by various people. And um, he felt that the, uh, the occupation of Baghdad and the, the destruction of the caliphate by the Mongols was, was, was basically a kind of illegitimate foreign, uh, foreign uh, sorry, ru rule by foreigners, rule of the mm. Islamic world by foreigners, which was illegitimate, even, if they, even though they professed to be Muslim. Now, this doctrine sort of lies dormant until, until uh, Abdul Wahhab picks it up in, in the 18th century, and this is the f sort of the founding ideology of what is now the Saudi state. Um, Al-Qaeda, uh, the, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, ISIS, and uh, Boko Haram, Taliban. the Taliban, they all tap into this specific sort of Islam. And it, it, it cannot be it cannot be overemphasized. Whatever quarrels they may have amongst one another, it looks like they share many goals in common. Now, the worst possible scenario to to uh, contemplate I in connection with all of this is that they might unite. They might they might put their put whatever small differences they have aside and uh, cooperate. We've seen a little bit of that with Boko Haram and, uh, and ISIS. If Al-Qaeda and, uh, and, uh, and ISIS get back together, that's a, that's a frightening prospect. Mm -hmm. Very well said. What do you think is the West's response to these terrorist attacks? Is it, is it uh, good enough? It's well, what do I think, what do I think it, it is? How, how do I think we're tackling? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a very difficult question. I mean, I f I feel as though this is this is a political this is a political problem. It's it's very difficult for I think it's very difficult for Canadians to to think of our country as 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 in any way under attack. Um, and this is despite the various indigenous terrorist groups that we've we've had here. We've you know I'm old enough to remember the FLQ. Uh, there were uh, uh, Dukabor bombs set off in uh, in British Columbia, uh, which my uh, uh, you know grandparents and great grandparents would have would have talked about. But it's still very difficult for us to think of think of North America as, or specifically Canada, as in any way under attack or somehow besieged. I think it's even harder um, for for many of us to imagine. The idea of, of w w what we call homegrown terrorists, even though we've seen examples of it uh, relatively recently, it's hard for us to imagine why uh, why why a person would turn to terrorism, why a person born and raised in Canada would turn to it. Uh, so, I think a lot of us are inclined to to dismiss it, to turn the other way, or to to find ways of excusing it or to blame ourselves to think of it as a, some sort of sociological problem. Now, I think that that's wrong. I think that that's, uh, I think that that's a very uh, injurious and, and wrong-headed way of, of approaching the problem. And of course, a lot of people will try to, you know, for fear of, a, for fear of offending uh, Muslims, they will try to uh, excuse uh, the, 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 the well, perhaps not excuse, perhaps whitewash the militant ideology that lies, th th that inspires terrorists. Now, if the problem isn't an ideological one, I would ask, what is the problem? 
And I think that that's where we run into a great deal of difficulty. We are not able to talk about the problem freely and, and openly. We are not able to discuss the problems of, of uh, uh, the problems that arise when a medieval uh, law code and a medieval uh, code of uh, uh, warfare and jihad come in contact, come in conflict with a society based on principles of the Enlightenment. And yet, this is exactly the same. Con this is exactly the conversation that we need to be having, um, because eventually, one side. I, if things escalate further, one side is going to have to win, and this is a conflict which I don't want to see get any worse. I think at this time I really want to divert your attention to the recent article written by Dr. Wesley Wark. He's a security expert, ah, yes. and he is uh, talking about not overdoing the counterterrorism measures. What is your take on it? How how can we uh, project the counterterrorism measures within within our society? Mm. Well, I thought that was a very interesting. Uh, article as well. Um, what do we mean by overdoing it? I mean, I, I think we're a very, very long way from, from overdoing it in, in quotation marks. I mean, in the, in, in, in the two world wars, enemy aliens were uh, locked up and put in internment camps. Uh, we're very, very far from, from anything along those lines. Uh, so, w w so what what exactly are we talking about in terms of a solution? Often we hear uh, we hear of counter countermeasures against against uh, domestic radicalization. Well, what does that really mean? I find I find myself scratching my head every time I hear that. What what does that really consist of, and in what way is that a measured response? I mean, are are we explaining to people? Uh, the ideas of uh, enlightenment society? Are we telling them that uh, we don't, we tend to have a dim view of people who believe that only one book has all the answers for life? Are we saying that? I, I, don't, I don't know, I, uh, probably not. So I would say that this idea of a measured, uh, insisting upon a measured response or insisting on some sort of balance or has, I mean, w I, we need to be talking about something much more substantial. Uh, before we can, you know, before we can really get into discussing a, a, a solution, that's what I that's what I would say about uh, Professor Wark's uh, article. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it to me it it is a very scary situation because we got reports right after the Brussels attack that um, terrorists in uh, Iraq they are posing pictures on YouTube and. They're rejoicing about it. Yeah. They are saying it is just the beginning of this nightmare. So at the one point we are saying we shouldn't overdo it. At the other uh, end, we have this monster of an enemy. So what is the middle ground? How can we uh, take the the right measures to stop terrorism? Well, I mean, this puts me in mind of two things. First of all, I would say that the th this goes back to this goes back to a previous point that that we were discussing, which is that. We can't afford to just sort of shrug this off. We have to take the threat seriously. If someone is on record saying, you know, the, the attack that we just uh, saw or lived through is only the beginning of, of more and worse problems, we have to take that seriously. We can't afford to just ignore it. Second, what is an appropriate what is an appropriate response? Well, it's very hard to say. Uh, we, I mean, I, 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 I'm old enough to remember being able to get on an airplane without having to take my shoes off or mm -hmm. without having to be, uh, you know, manhandled uh, by goons every time I, I, you know, fly within my own country. What happened in Brussels you know, like w w this, the, 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 the vast uh, measures of security that were in place were of no particular use because the bombings occurred while people were actually standing in, in, in the queues. What good was the security? It didn't really do anything. In fact, the security arguably caused this sort of uh, 
backup of, of, of people sort of spilling out into the, uh, in, into the, into the uh, uh, Brussels station, which made them a target. Where would we put extra security now? Where? We, there's nowhere. Uh, you know, we, 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 have, we have more than enough. Is there a further measure we can take to, uh, y you know, screen people? Well, I think we're at our limit there. So what would it be? I would agree that there has to be something done about, uh, uh, you know, trying to enforce a public awareness of, of, of suspicious activity or of, uh, you know, the terrorist uh, related uh, matters. But again, what would that consist of? Uh, are we going to, are we do we really have the stomach to go as far as to say, you know, this is what a suspicious package looks like this is what a terrorist looks like this is what because I, I don't think we're going to do it I, I i don't i don't see that as uh, a, a practical solution or one that would be politically very uh very palatable mm -hmm. so you know I, I i i don't know what it is that we're going to uh see as the right sort of solution we are going to talk about homegrown terrorism how the minds are radicalized after this short break when you or your loved one is injured in a car or slip and fall accident, one of the most important decisions you're going to make is the lawyer that you hire. At Alam Law, we take pride in the fact that every person who calls for a free consultation speaks to one of our personally lawyers, not just a legal assistant or agent. Call Alam Law at 416-625-2636 for a free consultation. And remember, you do not pay anything unless I win your case. There's a lot of reasons why I'm really happy to be working with Greenish, but one of the main ones is their brand philosophy, which is also my personal philosophy, and that is embracing this passion for life. They develop products that help you live your life to the fullest in a wholesome and a healthy way. And Greenish products are really those that I trust, and I trust that you'll trust them as well, because it's all about living your life to the fullest. Welcome back. This is Sarah Bukhari, and you're watching Power Dilemmas here with me at TAC TV. And we are going to continue our very interesting interview with uh, Dr. Michael Bonner, who is a linguist and is a DPhil from Oxford University. He has, uh, so far in the, in, in the interview, uh, we have discussed uh, the Brussels attack and the uh, terrorist ideology at large. So uh, getting back to the homegrown terrorism, uh, what is homegrown terrorism and um, how, how is the introduction of radicalization happening in the West? Well, that's a, that's a very important question. Uh, I think that it's basically homegrown terrorism is, is uh, the, uh, the exact opposite of uh, problems of, of uh, immigration on which it is usually uh, blamed. Homegrown terrorism is the is the uh, is the indigenous growth of the same sort of ideologies that we find that are find in ISIS or Al Qaeda, Boko Haram, and so forth. How how does it spread? Well, uh, I, I think that's going to be different in 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 uh, in each case. But the extent of the, the the presence that ISIS, for example, has online is extensive. It's very easy for them to recruit online. They have a they have social media. They have a Twitter account. They have an online magazine. The online magazine is is, is ridiculous. It it looks like it should be uh, a high school yearbook with uh, pictures of thugs on it, uh, talking about uh, the reestablishment of the caliphate and so forth. But it's obviously enough to uh, I inspire disaffected uh, uh, young people to to join up and to spread the same sort of ideology themselves. Now, this raises a very important question. How, how would we stop that? Uh, this is, th it's an almost insoluble problem. You can't control what uh, people think or uh, feel or believe privately, and the resources required to, to uh, destroy uh, the online presence of a terrorist group uh, are beyond uh, uh, beyond that of a, 
of of a, of a normal uh, Western government, and it would require a great deal of of uh, uh, of basically online uh, snooping. Mm -hmm. So dealing with that, dealing with that, I don't think we've yet found uh, I don't think we've yet found an adequate solution. Okay, because um, I was just wondering that uh, youth living in the West enjoying the ideals of democracy, equality, liberty, how could they be radicalized? How could they think to destroy or become a fighter machine, as we have seen in the case of uh, these um, uh, suicide bombers in Brussels? Again, a very difficult question. What, you know, what many people are inclined to say is that it's a failure on, on our part uh, to to stand up for uh, Western values, for Enlightenment values, and really for civilization uh, in general, and I think that I think that we would find that um, you know many of uh, uh, you know many of the people who are most angry at uh, ISIS would be the people who, who, who lived in the areas that they depopulated or that they destroyed. Uh, lovers of uh, art, culture, and civilization everywhere must deplore the destruction of Palmyra. I was in Palmyra in uh, 2000 and 2010, wow. just at the beginning of, uh, uh, of all of this, mm -hmm. and a great deal of it is now just a pile of rubble. And this should be enough to to uh, infuriate everyone. Now, it obviously isn't. Why? Is it because people don't know, uh, or young people don't know? They're not aware of of the advantages that they enjoy. Are they bored? Are they uh, simply angry at mm -hmm. things that that uh, that we don't? Uh, fully, uh, th that they don't fully understand, but uh, one of the oddest parallels is that the, or the oddest parallels that I can that I can draw is between the sort of disaffected youth who go off and join ISIS and the sort of youth that you find on American campuses and uh, elsewhere who want to ban everything and shut down freedom of speech or who feel very deeply offended at everything. This looks like a general lack of confidence, a crisis of identity, and and you know I don't I don't know what to do about it, and mm -hmm. I, I I'm not sure if a political solution is the uh, is the right one. How would a government reinstill confidence in a in a civilization after it has after it has perished? I I, I don't know. Now. I could be wrong. People could still feel a great deal of uh, quiet uh, pride in, 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 their, in their culture and civilization or in Western, Western values, Western legal system, the, the, uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment. But I'm inclined to doubt it. I mean, in, in Ontario alone, the, uh, the, the McGuinty government was flirting with the Sharia. Uh, and uh, you know, luckily they didn't go any further with that. But uh, how did we get to that point? I mean, mm -hmm. I think that that's a, that's a, that's a serious question that we have to we have to ask ourselves. And if if living in Canada, feeling feeling uh, safe from uh, threats, being uh, uh, well fed, well educated, isn't good enough to prevent someone from joining a terrorist organization, well, we, we have a lot of soul-searching and self-questioning to do. Mm -hmm. Moving forward, uh, should the crime prevention agencies, police and um, other uh, agencies, how should they treat terrorists? Should they treat them as normal criminals or differently? Well, this is the point uh, that, uh, what is his name, uh, Thiessen was making in, in his recent article in the Washington Post. Washington Post, Mark Thiessen, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I, th I think I think that it's an important point. Terrorism is not uh, 
it, it isn't in the same league, in, in my view, as, 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 uh, as an ordinary crime, uh, nor is it in the same league as, uh, as a, a sort of a mental disturbance or a psychiatric illness. It's different. And with the potential harm that it can, uh, can do to, to uh, non-combatants, to ordinary people, we have to take it much more seriously than 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 we do. Uh, if if only for the purpose of of uh, of uh, 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 deterring further similar crimes, that you know people who plot to blow up a train or something or whatever they may wish to do, if if they are unsuccessful and and they don't uh, and they they fail to 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 kill anyone. You know, we are mercifully spared the 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 the, the agony of of uh, uh, having to having to endure the deaths of many people, but the crime should should be treated very very severely. We have to look into uh, uh, the, the 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 terrorist uh, contacts. We have to understand where where they were uh, radicalized, perhaps also why they were radicalized. Uh, we've got to do whatever we can to root it out and stop it. You know, this is this is not on the level of, uh, you know, drunk driving or or, or you know, sort of uh, gang violence. This is this is something different. Mm -hmm. You just uh, mentioned Mark Thiessen uh, of the Washington Post, and he is in the same I think same piece. He's pointed out that uh, the Brussels terrorist attack was a failure in interrogation. Uh, tactics yeah. uh, by the prevention uh, crime prevention agency. What is your take on it? Was it a failure? Well, it looks like it was a failure. The uh, the the person in question, Abdeslam, was uh, apprehended and held, and I it took uh, a day, I believe, if I remember correctly. It took a day for them even to uh, to to begin questioning him, and they held off for for uh, doing so. Uh, held off from doing so uh, initially simply because he was tired, or, or so the reports were. And I think that that's totally unacceptable. And it was a matter of days, uh, four days uh, before the, the, the bombings in Brussels occurred, and they could have been prevented. So I would say that it was a failure, and that we have to really have to be much more, uh, much more serious and vigilant about this in future. Mm -hmm. Um, getting back to our communities in Canada, because we are living in Canada, or the Western countries in Europe, how can we partner with the vulnerable Muslim communities uh, to stop radicalization of youth, to stop them to slip into the, uh, you know, the maybe the attraction of terrorism or attraction of being a jihadi? How can we partner with the community? A, a very good question. I think it's important to stress that. Uh, no one in Canada is is uh, well. Everyone in Canada is a victim of this. It's not as though we're somehow, uh, you know, uh, that there are some people who are somehow un unaffected by the the consequences of radicalization. We are all affected. It is corrosive to our society and it undermines our uh, our entire country. That said. What do we do? Well, we have to instill. We have to instill. I think confidence in in our country, confidence in our uh, in our secular uh, enlightenment society, in our uh, common law legal system, and I, I would I would add further that although we are uh, although we are a, a, a multicultural uh, polyethnic and polylinguistic society, what makes us strong is not the diversity. What makes us strong is the common values that we have, the common uh, allegiance to a stable and uh, orderly constitution and a, uh, uh, an enlightened uh, judicial system and uh, uh, principles of, of, of freedom and, and, and ordered liberty. 
And if we, if we forget that, uh, I think we're doomed. Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful talking to you, Dr. Bonner, and uh, for our viewers. Uh, do have uh, the copy of a uh, book by Dr. Michael Richard Bonner, and the name of the book is Al Dinbari's Kitab Al Ahbar Al Tival. Uh, wonderful talking to you, and thank you so much for listening to our today's uh, show, Power Dilemma with Sarah Bukhari. Terrorism is a real threat, and uh, the challenge right now for the people living in the West is uh, to stop radicalization, particularly to the uh, Muslim communities. Uh, we have to create certain conditions and environment where uh, less and less uh, youth is uh, kind of attracted to the radicalization or the jihadist um, ideology. Thank you very much, and I hope uh, to see you again. Thank you. Number one multicultural channel. This is Tag TV.